Hello class and welcome to the fifth lecture video here for unit five where we finish out aerobic cellular respiration with step three the electron transport chain so let's get started all right so this is going to occur along the cristae or the inner the foldings of the inner membrane that we saw inside of the mitochondria so the matrix is the center of the mitochondria and what separates it from the intermembrane space would be the cristae What's happening during this process of the electron transport chain is what we call oxidative phosphorylation. It's going to be very similar to what we saw during the light reactions called photophosphorylation, but instead of light energy exciting electrons and using those electrons to create a hydrogen ion gradient, we are now going to be using the electrons that we've been chipping away at as we've been breaking down glucose since we started glycolysis. And the electrons from glucose will be used to create the hydrogen ion gradient that we then use to make ATP. So in order to do this process, we're going to need some inputs here. The first of three inputs would be all of the NADHs that have been made all along the way for aerobic cellular respiration. So there's going to be a total of 10 NADHs. Two came from glycolysis, two from two turns of the prep step, and six from two turns of the Krebs cycle. We'll also throw in there two FADH2s, which came from two turns of the Krebs cycle. And finally, we're going to need some oxygen here. Oxygen is going to serve as the final electron acceptor here in the mitochondria during the electron transport chain. So you and I are breathing right now, not only just to get rid of CO2, but to bring in oxygen so it can serve as this final electron acceptor. Our outputs are going to be ATP, and we're going to get 34 of them just from this process alone. All right, refresh your memory. We only got four so far up to this point, two net from glycolysis and two from two turns of the Krebs cycle. So now we're going to cash in our money. All right, now we're going to get 34 total ATP. Water will be produced as a waste product, and I'll show you where that gets produced. And all of the oxidized electron carriers, the NAD+, and the FAD that are produced, will then diffuse back to any of the prior processes, glycolysis, Krebs, the prep step, so they can be reused again and get reduced um, in the further breakdown of more glucose molecules. All right, so let's get started and look over our steps. All right, so step number one is going to be all of the NADH and FADH2s that were made are going to bring the electrons and hydrogen atoms that they're carrying, and these would have been obtained from glucose as we we're breaking it down, to the electron transport chain, which is in the cristae. Once they reach the cristae, each NADH and FADH2 will be oxidized, where they'll donate both a pair of electrons and hydrogen ions or atoms into the chain itself. So these electrons that are given into the chain you're going to see are going to start to move down the ETC and be used to pull these hydrogen ions up into the intermembrane space. So all the proteins that are along the ETC, we're going to give one generic term. Even though it doesn't accurately describe all of them, we're going to call them cytochromes. So instead of referencing a PS2 and PS1 and ETC like we did um, in the light reactions, we're just going to call every protein responsible for carrying the electrons cytochromes. So as these electrons that came from NADH and FADH2 move down the electron transport chain, or the ETC, all right, the cytochromes are going to pass them on one after the other. And as the electrons move along the cytochromes, they're going to pull hydrogen ions from the matrix, the very center of the mitochondria. And these are the same hydrogen ions that were just released when we oxidize NADH and FADH2. The electrons are going to pull them up into the intermembrane space. So what we're doing right now is we're creating a large hydrogen ion gradient. Just like I described when we first started photosynthesis, we're putting water behind a dam. Eventually that large concentration of hydrogen ions that have been built up into the, in the intermembrane space are going to actually flow now back into the matrix. They're going to go flow from high to low, so from intermembrane space back into the matrix through our good old buddy here, ATP synthase, the exact same enzyme that we used in the light reactions for photosynthesis, photosynthesis causing it to spin like a turbine, generating ATP energy. 
All right, this is much more efficient than how ATP was made during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. That was called substrate level phosphorylation, where an enzyme just adds one phosphate group at a time to an ADP molecule. It's very slow and inefficient. This is much more inefficient and gives you a lot more bang for the buck. And as I had said earlier, oxygen is going to serve as the final electron acceptor in this process. When oxygen accepts the electrons, it'll also bind to some hydrogens and become water. And water is the waste product of this reaction. Remember, water was needed, was a reactant for photosynthesis. Now it is a waste product for cellular respiration. So if we look at this diagram below, this region here where my pointer is, is the matrix. This lipid bilayer would be the cristae. And this area here where you see all the hydrogen ions is the intermembrane space. Each blue blob in the cristae is a cytochrome. The yellow arrows are showing you the pathway that the electrons are going to take until they get to the end of the ETC. Here are the NADHs and the FADH2s. Notice that NADH starts the process. It'll add its electrons as well as its hydrogen. So see this H+. Plus? That's actually coming from the NADH once it's oxidized. The FADH2 starts just a little bit further down. It can't bind to this protein. All right, it only reacts with NADH in particular, so it has to kind of go down the line a little bit. So when NADH donates its electrons, its electrons pass through from cytochrome to cytochrome. And as they do, follow these arrows here, the electrons will attract hydrogen ions, usually a pair at a time, and suck them up here into the intermembrane space. So for NADH, that'll happen one, two, three times it has a chance to pull up a pair of hydrogen ions. That's going to be important later on. The FADH2s, once they donate their electrons into the chain right here, they forego and skip this step. So the electrons from FADH2 will only have one, two opportunities as they move down the ETC to pull hydrogen ions up into the intermembrane space. Now, when these electrons get to the end of the chain, something has to be there to accept them. If nothing's there to accept them, those electrons could be released, and they could interact with any other components of the mitochondrial membrane and possibly destroy it or significantly damage it. So we don't want that to happen. So what the mitochondria does, it uses oxygen here. All right, Don't worry about the half O2 right now. Just pretend that we just need oxygen itself. The electrons will bind to oxygen here. The oxygen becomes negatively charged, so it will attract positively charged hydrogen ions that are all over the place, and you get water as a waste product. All right, Your cells could use this water, but for this process itself, it is a waste product and it is not directly needed um, for the reaction to continue. So first off, we follow the electron flow here to create the gradient and now finally that gradient the hydrogen ions are going to flow back into the matrix from high to low through ATP synthase causing it to spin like a turbine and generate ATP by again rephosphorylating adding a phosphate group back onto ADP to make ATP so this whole process here is what we refer to again as oxidative phosphorylation. The source of these electrons moving through the chain did not come from light as they did in photophosphorylation. They came immediately from NADH and FADH2, but where did those come from? From the slow, steady breakdown of glucose, from the very first step in glycolysis, followed by the PrEP step, and then the Krebs cycle. So again, Oxidative phosphorylation is when the flow of hydrogen ions from the intermembrane space back into the matrix occurs through ATP synthase. That's going to cause ATP synthase. Once again, you can see down below here where my pointer is, the spin like a turbine every time some hydrogen ions flow down into the matrix, providing the power to produce ATP. So again, just take a moment here to look at this little animation. 
Again, NADH starts here. So once you see these NADH electrons come in, they'll have one, two, three opportunities to pull up hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. Well, FADH2 only has one, two opportunities. So it doesn't contribute as much to the gradient as NADH does. As a result, make sure you get this down in your heads, one NADH can produce three ATP molecules because it had three opportunities to pull up hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. But each FADH2 can only make upwards of two ATP. Again, that's because it starts right here, skips a step, and only has two opportunities to pull up hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. Again, right here, as the electrons get to the end, it binds with oxygen and you produce water as a waste product. So this is the oxidative part using the electron movement to create your gradient up here. The phosphorylation is when the hydrogen ions flow back into the matrix. So from intermembrane space into the matrix to make ATP, causing ATP synthase to spin like a turbine and make ATP. So recall our reactants. There were 10 NADHs that come to the ETC. So that means those 10 NADHs, if you do 10 times 3 ATPs a piece, you're now going to get 30 ATP from just the 10 NADHs that we've been making all along this pathway of cellular respiration. Add those 30 to the two FADH2s that each make two ATPs apiece, so 2 times 2 is 4, so 30 plus 4 is the ETC is going to provide a cell with 34 ATP just in this one step alone. So in conclusion, all right, anaerobic when there's no oxygen present versus aerobic, which we just looked at, aerobic is 19 times more efficient than anaerobic respiration. All right, how do I get that number? If you look here at the chart for anaerobic, again, the energy yield is only 2 ATP net. And recall that only came from glycolysis and fermentation, either alcoholic or lactic acid, occurred afterwards simply to provide NAD plus back to glycolysis to keep it going. But if we do full-blown aerobic respiration, our theoretical net yield is going to be 38 ATP. So 19 times 2 gives me 38. That's where I get that 19 times more efficient value. So again, with aerobic respiration, we have both oxygen and mitochondria present. So we can do glycolysis. In this chart, it calls it the link reaction, but that would be the prep step, followed by Krebs, followed by what we just covered today for the electron transport chain. So using this picture here in conclusion, in glycolysis, we make 2 ATP net directly. That's what this straight arrow means. During glycolysis, we made 2 NADHs. These will be used in the ETC to make 6 ATPs. Remember, 1 NADH makes 3 ATPs, so 2 times 3 is 6. During pyruvate conversion here in the matrix, when pyruvate, 2 pyruvates get converted into 2 acetyl-CoA's, that gives us two NADHs that will also give us six ATP in the ETC. Once the Krebs cycle happens twice and all of glucose has been released now as carbon dioxide, from two turns we got two ATP directly. Six NADH from two turns would give us a total of 18 ATP, so the Krebs cycle really paid off. All right, again, six times three ATPs each gives me 18 and then from two turns of the Krebs cycle one per turn we made two FADH2s each one gives us two ATPs two times two is four do your magic addition and you get a theoretical net yield of 38 ATP all right the gross would be 40 but we got to go back and subtract the two that we used here to get glycolysis going and we get 38 net ATP.